All right, happy Monday, everybody. Good afternoon. I am delighted today to welcome to the 21st episode of Scholars Forum on Patristicast, Dr. Lincoln Blumel. Uh, Dr. Blumel is now a full professor in the Department of Ancient Scripture at Brigham Young University in Provo, Utah, the beautiful state of Utah. He, his work specializes in early Christianity as well as Greek and Coptic papyrology and epigraphy. He has two books, notably, that are uh, relevant for this podcast, a Lettered Christians, Christians, Letters, and Late Antique Oxyrhynchus, published by Brill in 2012, and Christian Oxyrhynchus, Texts, Documents, and Sources, Baylor University Press 2015. Today, I am welcoming Dr. Lamel to talk about his work on the fascinating fourth century teacher of Christian philosophy, Didymus the Blind, Dr. Blumel. Thank you for joining Patristicast. It's good to have you. It is good to be here. Thank you so much for having me out. I really, uh, I, I never pop up, pass up an opportunity to talk either about Didymus or Papyri. So uh, the pleasure is all mine. Well, uh, I'm looking forward to a wonderful conversation. But before we get to Didymus, I want to talk big picture stuff. Okay. Because your work, you're not traditionally trained as a theologian. So people who are watching this who might want to talk about Didymus and his theology, because he does get into theological debates, uh, might be a little bit shocked to see that we're actually going to talk about something a little bit different. We're going to talk about the work that you do with papyrology and how that informs what we can learn about Didymus, because we're going to enter into a classroom. We're going to enter into a fourth century classroom today. And we're going to do so because you are treating a text like an artifact, which is kind of a, a, an innovative way of treating text. So before we get to Didymus, I want to read a quote from an essay that you wrote in the Oxford Handbook of Early Christian Biblical Interpretation that's going to set the stage. So here we go. Our engagement with ancient Christianity is principally a textual one. Yes, we don't have many photos. Early Christians wrote texts, sermons, letters, gospels, apocalypses, etc., which were circulated, read, and copied. But while early Christians were in some sense a, quote, people of the book, end quote, the extant textual remains are rather small and, and fragmentary for the first few centuries. Consequently, Many of the documents we read today are based on copies with the result that the earliest textual witnesses we possess for some Christian writings were produced hundreds or even 1,000 years after the original was composed. I'm gonna go on a little bit further down here. So treating texts as artifacts. While these texts, while the texts these early artifacts transmit have been abundantly studied by comparison so we read them a lot, we talk about what they say. There has been relatively little attention given to what the physical artifacts that convey these texts can reveal. Okay, little attention has been given to what the physical artifacts that convey these texts can reveal. Say something about that. That's a very interesting uh, observation. You bet. Um... You know what it is, right? Let's just take you know, a New Testament, okay? So we kind of have, you know, for those New Testament, you know, the Nestle Alon 20th edition, right? And we're used to an apparatus and everything. Or, you know, you take a standard patristic text, you know, in a series, you're kind of, you know, the Greek text or Latin text and apparatus at the bottom. Well, when you go back and you begin looking, of course, at, you know, ancient, you know, copies of these, now we often, in many cases, go back via medieval manuscripts, and that's kind of where it ends. Mm -hmm. um, but we do have, right, um, in some rare cases, and typically from Egypt, texts that are either fragmentary, right, you have a scrap or a whole page, or in the case of Didymus that we'll get to, um, hundreds and hundreds, well over a thousand sheets of Didymus written within, you know, a hundred years of his lifetime or copied within that. And so there's things that you can see about the use of a text that you don't see from, you know, a modern critical edition, as good as that is with variants and things like that in manuscript trees and families, you know, some things that it reveals, right? You look at the hand, you know, and a hand tells you a lot about a text. Is this a nice 
unseal script, right? So was this produced perhaps in a professional scriptorium? Mm -hmm. Or was it maybe a personal copy that somebody may have copied out, right? What's on the back of it? Is there a letter on the back, a receipt on the back? Mm -hmm. You know, um, there have been, uh, some people have noted, for example, that a lot of what we call right today, right, are apocryphal gospels, right? Or just the gospels that weren't in the canon. Um, many of those appear in miniature codex form based on the dimensions of a sheet. Or if you look at, you know, even if it's a fragment where, you know, the verses appear on one side, you go to the other side, you figure how much approximately I'm missing. And so there's a miniature codex. You say, well, it's probably for personal use, not for liturgical use. Mm -hmm. Whereas we'll have fragments where it's very clear, right? I mean, from a gospel or something else, where this is a very large fragment. It's probably written in two columns. You're like, well, this is clearly must then be a liturgical usage of this. Mm -hmm. And it's just somebody, you know, carrying around, you know, this large uh, book. And so there are things you can tell from actually looking at, you know, the paleography, the way it's laid out on a page, um, notation um, in the margins, who's reading it, what are they uh, saying? Um, and, you know, is it written on papyrus or is it written on vellum? Mm -hmm. Um, is written on metal. Mm -hmm. You know, in some cases you get things like this. So these are things I think that, you know, we're really interested in the text, which I think is great. We should be interested in the text. But when we have this material, um, we should try to look at the material remains and say, okay, how can we kind of help flesh out this picture? And maybe say some things. Okay, it's a fragment from Matthew. Well, it's a really big fragment, right? I.e., it looks like the, the page layout. Oh, it's probably maybe it was used actually in a church service, not probably an individual copy. Mm -hmm. um, or so there's different kind of handwriting. Um, or multiple handwritings. Well, what's that doing? Yeah, and that allows us to determine, for example, so if you get a beautifully written text, you know, like one of the, the great biblical, the unsealed codices of the Bible, obviously copied by a very well-trained scribe. And that says something about the demographics of the group that produced it. it says something about what kind of status Christi Christians had attained in the empire by the time those were written. Whereas in some other texts, maybe the handwriting isn't quite so neat and it's a little bit messy. And that might also tell us something about the group in which that text was composed. Is that kind of what you're getting at? Yeah, you can't, you know, handwriting, right? It doesn't always have to be. I think sometimes it can be revealing, right? Okay. So, you know, um, you know, C.H. Roberts noticed when he began looking at Christian manuscripts, he says, you know, I look at these early gospels or other fragments of literary works. He says, I'm going to call them a quote unquote reformed documentary hand, unquote. He says, they're not like these kind of, you know, amazing fragments of like Homer or Euripides, something like that. And again, not all Homer's amazing or Euripides mm -hmm. that are clearly written by scribes who are exceptionally well trained. But he's saying you're finding more his inference, which I, I don't think is, you know, inappropriate. I think we have to make some inferences. Seems to be this is probably a, you know, a, these are not, you know, written in, you know, by high-end scribes, probably more everyday writing for people who are kind of maybe have a job and also just copying text. And so he's trying to say something about the sociology of early Christianity. Okay. Um, and again, when you look at some of these texts, you could say, yes, this is something with the status, right? This is a lot of work was put into this uh, text. When you look even at way, the way the hand is written, even today with books, right? You can kind of tell by you know, what is the cover like? You know, the pages, are they glossy? Are there pictures? All these things can tell you about the book. Mm -hmm. If you only had this kind of one page ripped out left of that, you could yeah. make some inferences about that. And so we can do some of that, which let's, let's I think, say, answer some, some social issues about those who are producing texts. And so you talk about Roberts and then his, uh, his colleague Skeet and Roger Bagnall and the late Larry Hurtado. They have made a great deal about th this shift that happens in the Roman Empire, particularly within Christianity. And that is the shift from the, the kind of material and the, the um, how do you, the, I guess the material itself of the writing going from a, a book roll or a scroll, which would be unfolded, to a codex, which is more akin to our book that we know of today, where you can turn pages. Can you say a little bit, some, something a little bit about that shift? Because that seems to be pretty important. And it, was, it wasn't completely unique to Christians, but it was predominantly a Christian phenomenon from my understanding. 
you know, you do find this. And so what you generally have, like in like papyrological remains, right, sit with Egypt, but, but even when you look at, you know, stuff from like, um, you know, frescoes, things like that, people are look, typically holding scrolls. And mm -hmm. this is kind of early Roman Empire. Um, and a scroll is typically written on one side. Right, we have an epistograph and scroll written on both sides. They're kind of rare. You, you can have that. Mm -hmm. um, you know, epistographs met, mentioned in you know a Book of Revelation, right? This little book or little scroll written on inside now because there's so much, okay. and that was kind of the standard way. So you know, think of Homer, right? Each book would be a scroll length, and you have all these scrolls make a Homer. But you then have a technological advancement um, within the Roman Empire, and you know, yes, there, there's evidence you know some codex-like things before that, but it took a while, I, I think, for Roman literary culture to, to adapt to that. They're fairly conservative, right? We're using a scroll, right? This is kind of what we, we've used traditionally. We're not going to change this new codex thing. It took time. But what's interesting is a lot of the early Christian remains, right? Beginning, uh, you know, as, as some of these, you know, date to sometime the second century, the third century, is you find a lot of this stuff. It's very clear it's on a codex, i.e. a book, because you know, if you have little fragments written on both sides, you can kind of chart it out. Mm -hmm. um, and so it seems to me that, you know, Christians are using this new technology and there, there's been discussion of this. Why use a book over a scroll? And it's clear some of the stuff they have are, are scrolls. Also there's nothing written on the back. Um, you know, you can put a lot more in a codex than you could in, in a scroll. Um, you know, some talk about, right, Paul's letters perhaps, right? There's a very famous, right? Collection of Paul's letters in the papyri um, spread between collections in Ireland and University of Michigan. That are all in codex form. Maybe this is how you begin compiling stuff, or this is the beginning of a Christian canon, mm -hmm. putting it into a book uh, format for referencing, for missionization. Mm -hmm. And so I think, you know, the evidence is such that you tend to find Christians using codices um, predominantly. And I think there is a little bit of a correlation um, with what we find, what becomes canonical, what we tend to find in codex, you know, format. Um, not, you know, completely, you know, complete, but we're maybe kind of reading between the lines the best we can, right, from these impressionistic bits and pieces of evidence, how can we now begin to create a larger narrative of Christianity mm -hmm. and some of the production of texts? And so the codex and its use really becomes important. And then by the time of the fourth century, we now have these pandect Bibles, right? The Bible, mm -hmm. you can put it between two covers where, you know, the technology would have been there early on, but Christians are, are still using this. And so I think it's worthwhile asking questions, how does that affect process like canonization okay. or collection of letters, right? It's clear we're missing some of Paul's letters. I think we're actually missing probably a few, quite a few of Paul's letters, but you know, these ones get collected and early time is now they're in a codex, a four gospel codex uh, and, and things um, like that are, are questions we can begin to broach when you have the actual remains, which are questions people weren't really talking about because we didn't have those kind of remains or we're studying the artifact. We just study the text and the text studying the text is great, but there's now a new set of questions we can we can begin to address. Yeah, you mentioned those pandect Bibles, um, like the Codex Sinaiticus or the Codex Alexandrinus. If I'm, doesn't one of them, I can't remember which one, contain the Shepherd of Hermas, and is it, uh, uh, is it First Clement, Clement of Rome, or something like that? I can't remember, but it's books that are non-canonical that are also included in this codex, isn't that? Is that that right? is true. Um, Alexandrinus has a couple uh, in there, and um, I want to say Sinaiticus also has, uh, is it Clement? Uh, is that a double check? I know Alexandrinus does have additional uh, material. And, and, you know, some of these others, it's hard because you don't have all of things or missing parts. Yeah. But yeah, you actually do have that as part of that. And so you wonder now, what does this say about canon, right? Especially you know well, right, Athanasius is a 39th festival letter in uh, AD 373, right, about a canon. Here's the books we read for edification, and other books we look at for scripture. Mm -hmm. And you're finding some of this stuff, right, that's more for edification in text, probably produced about the same mm -hmm. uh, time. And, and I think when Athanasius says that, um, he's speaking because that's what he's desiring, not actually necessarily going on. And right. I, I don't want to be, there's some, you know, I'm reading all kinds of books, and they're all over the place, but um, it's probably because people are reading other things or considering things canon-like, mm -hmm. which Athena says, no, this is just for edification, or maybe even you know, might deem heretical or something like that. Right, yeah, that, his letter is like one of the earliest known lists, I think, of what a bishop thought was the canon. And if I'm not mistaken, I think it wasn't until the Council of Trent in the 1500s where we finally get the first time a council determines what belongs in the canon and what is outside of it. I don't 
I don't, there wasn't anything before that, was there? You know, I, I think there's, there's a local council in Carthage, I think, in about 393. Okay. That talks about canon, but there's none of the ecumenical councils. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I always get a kick out of the Da Vinci Code, right? Burning Gospels and doing all yeah. kinds of stuff like that. The only thing it's saying burned, of course, are the writings of Arius after the fact. <laughs> but even I see it, see it, you, know, you look at this, no one's debating that. They're only deba all the texts are debating are already in our canon. Right. Um, right. And so, you, you know, you do have, the only one I can think of is the Council of Carthage. Okay. In 393 that addresses, but it's not a big binding ecumenical council. So right. it's probably, yeah, sometime later. And it would even surprise me if Trent or something like this is uh, when. I think it was at the Council of Trent, but somebody who watches this is probably going to correct me at some point. Anyway, the, so, okay, text says artifacts. Now, people who work with artifacts, they do excavations, they discover things by digging. And in the 1940s, in the early 1940s, uh, during World War II, in a town in Egypt called Tura, there was a major discovery. Can you talk a little bit about that discovery, the Tura papyri, because that's going to be where we find our friend Didymus. Yes, I would be happy to. So what you have is Tura, it, it's just, it, it basically it's south of Cairo today, or kind of southern Cairo. And it's... Um, Basically, historically, it was a large limestone quarry. Lots of caves, um, a quarry there, a lot of limestone that was used in the surrounding um, area. And so what you have is in the uh, early stages of World War II, when you had British forces stationed there, right, fighting um, the Nazis, uh, they approached uh, King Farouk I uh, for a munitions bunker. Where can we store some of our munitions? And he said, well, you can use these caves uh, in South Cairo and Torah. You can go put stuff there. And so they had uh, a survey team of engineers who went and began, right, surveying the cave systems. And there, there's various stories. Um, you know, uh, Blossom Stefani has done a lot of good work on this in her work, trying to reconstruct what was going on there um, with this. Um, but basically what you have is the discovery here at this time of a number of folia of texts that were hitherto unknown and had been there uh, basically in a, a cave, right, in debris and things like this that were discovered uh, that contained, um, uh, well, like I say, uh, well over a thousand pages of Didymus and also uh, texts of origin mm -hmm. that you had in these various codices uh, from uh, Torah uh, written, uh, you know, well, we'll talk more about paleography, but in, in the, you know, century or two after Didymus's life. And so, What's interesting, I think probably the best working hypothesis of, you know, why did all these, you know, unbound manuscripts end up in this cave in Tura? And of course, then, you know, Allied forces discover it and then eventually kind of makes its way into the antiquities market after the war, begins being published. And I had a part of that because some of it ended up here in the U.S. Um, but probably what's going on is, as you well know, right, uh, Origin and Didymus, right, are posthumously condemned um, and ex excommunicated uh, posthumously. Um, at the Lateran Council. Um, and I, I imagine, right, their writings are probably well, condemned along with this, right? We, I talk about Arius, right? His writings were consigned to the flames by Constantine. Mm -hmm. And so I can imagine, right, their writings kind of fall out of use. They're not copied, maybe in some cases even destroyed. And so, you know, there's a nearby monastery called, right, the Monastery of the Mule. And, um, you know, that had, you know, there anciently. And so I, I think I posit that probably we know that monasteries were repositories of books. Um, you know, scriptoria, also libraries. I could imagine, right, a scenario where someone goes and deposits these there because of the status that Origen did them as find themselves posthumously, um, maybe thinking, hey, you know, maybe, you know, they'll come back into good graces at some point, and they never come and retrieve these texts with the result, then they're discovered, right, some 1500 years later, mm -hmm. and then um, begin being, you know, translated then in the, the 60s, 50s and 60s. Uh, by scholars, principally in right Germany and France, and then we had the, the one case here in the U.S. Yeah. So yeah, they're around this time. So Didymus died. Didymus died what in three in the three ninety eight. Three ninety eight. Yeah, he died right kind of before he and Evagoras, I think, who dies in three ninety nine, uh, died right before the outbreak of you know what's called the first Origenist controversy. Mm -hmm. uh, which takes place in the monasteries of Egypt and in the, um, the Patriarchate of Alexandria. I've had a, a couple of my previous scholars just right before you, um, Christoph Marxis and, and mm -hmm. um, Samuel Rubinson, we've talked a little bit about this. We've gotten into the originist controversy. 
And Didymus is, falls right in line with the, the origins method of interpreting the Bible spiritually, allegorically, metaphorically, however you want to describe it, um, and Evagrius as well. So, it, I mean, it would kind of make sense. And now, as you say, it was what, 150, 200 years, Justinian, I think, Emperor Justinian in the 550s officially condemns them. You have anathemas issued against them. And there, so there's anathema issued against them, right? The, what, the Second Council of Constant, uh, I want to say Constantinople in 553. And then it's the, next, the Lateran Council, I think it's 649. That in fact, they're then posthumously right, communicated. So yeah, hundreds of years after they were dead, uh, their thought and their works are condemned. Some of them survive, you know, or some of Origen's works survived. Sadly, not all of them. Um, but so in this find, there's a number of commentaries from Didymus. So he's got what commentaries on Genesis, um, Zechariah, Zechariah, Ecclesiastes, Ecclesiastes and Psalms, and Psalms. So you have in this volume here. Didymus the Blind's commentary on Psalms 26, verse 10 through 29, verse 2, and Psalm 36, verses 1 to 3. So in Provo is at BYU is this fragment from the Tura Papyri. And you show in here, and I, you're not the only one who shows this, but it's abundantly clear that this is not. Didymus the Blind, uh, a solitary scholar sitting at his desk, composing a written commentary. These are actually lectures that take place in a classroom, and there are questions that students ask that show up in the material. Can you, what can we learn about the classroom of Didymus the Blind in these lectures? Well, that, that's a great, uh, great, great question. And let me just go back. I'll kind of do a bit, a bit of a you know segue into this. You know, how did the papyri, you know, in Egypt and end up in of all places Provo, Utah? Yeah. Right. Right. And so, just a quick disconnection to that, and then I'll start going to the demo stuff. So, you have all these sheets. They begin being divided by Allied, you know, uh, troops, and then they hit the antiquities market a lot. End up in, um, you know, uh, well, in Geneva, right, London, uh, Germany, and. Um, an American engineer eventually gets a hold of some and sends them to his brother-in-law in Boston, where they basically stay in an attic for a number of decades until the death of the brother-in-law and his uh, uh, now widow uh, wants to do something with these and goes to a family friend who will take them to Harvard, say, you know, I want to buy some papyri. And of course, they're kind of like, who is this person with papyri? But this person was alumnus of BYU and so came to BYU and BYU ultimately ended up acquiring them. Okay. And so they acquired, right, the section they acquired were the pages that covered Didymus's commentary on Psalm, right, from 2610 to the first part of 29. They got another page from the beginning of Psalm 36. Mm -hmm. and, and they've been here since 1983, never been published. And so one of the things that I began doing was uh, working um, on those and getting out an addition transcription publication. But when, when you see these, right, so these, you know, we call it a commentary on Psalms. Yeah. It, it's really, that's the title of the book, but as I say in the book, it, it's really his lectures on Psalms. Mm -hmm. And also you have his lectures on Ecclesiastes, you know, going back to this idea of handwriting. Yep. When you look at the handwriting of the text in um, Job or Genesis or Zechariah, Compared to the handwriting of Ecclesiastes and Psalms, which, by the way, is by the very same scribe, I argue, one's clearly a literary hand. It's written in nice, you know, kind of unsealed script. And this is more of a rap rapid documentary script. So right now you're saying, okay, something's up. Why are these two written in this distinctly different hand? And oh, it's, you know, bad, bad scribe. But what you then see is then to see questions appear in these. And there's not like rhetorical questions where somebody might be preaching or talking, saying, well, let me ask a question and then answer it. It's very clear these are really at times elementary questions or questions pushing Didymus where you're like, this makes no sense for him to be rhetorically asking us. And it's very clear then that what we're seeing in the Ecclesiastes and Psalms are a series of lectures he's giving on those texts. And that I think explains a lot of the, some of the monotony that, of it where he repeats himself constantly or focus on one word and go through this. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And probably the scribal hand, right? This, this abbreviation, epair, uh, epsilon pi, epsilon rho for right question. Um, you find the manuscript. And so you get these questions uh, from students. And the questions really range quite the gamut, right? From some very basic stuff um, 
you know, for example, you know, there's one where, you know, in the section we looked at the Psalms that I translated was, you know, um, where, you know, the Psalm says, do not drag me away with the sinners. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, a student chimes in and says, you know, how could a saint say yeah. this? Yeah. And then Didymus says, well, you know, even, you know, saints aren't perfect. He says, well, sometimes saints put on a new prosopon, right? A new <laughs> face yeah. to, so they can relate. Because the student's saying, well, how could David be possibly a sinner, right? I'm a saint. This whole idea is kind of built up. And so he then gives an explanation for that. And what you often find is the questions are kind of clustered in the Psalms commentary, in the Ecclesiastes, where it's clear that it's almost like he will lecture, then there's almost like a deliberate kind of Q&A period near an end, perhaps, of a session. And yeah, there'll be questions scattered uh, throughout. And at times, they even have the note question in the manuscript, there's no question. Maybe a scribe didn't copy it down, but it's really interesting. You see kind of this, this going on. And, and they kind of, you know, point out a little bit of the classroom of uh, Didymus, where when you start looking at some of this stuff, certainly in the Psalms, you know, he one of the things you're trying to do is trying to teach them right prosody. How do you read a text? Um, how do you know who the speaker is? Um, we want to know the words. What, what, and he'll do like a lexical concordance. Where he'll take one word and say, well, this word also appears over here in the Septuagint mm -hmm. or over here in the Gospels. And, you know, I would say two thirds of the times he's right, one third he's wrong. <laughs> he fixes every word. But, but, he, but it's a close word, right? And so he'll use that. And so it's like he's teaching, well, here's how you exegete a text. You use exegesis by other scripture, mm -hmm. then apply and you read it in that way. Um, he'll go to talk about, you know, um, different readings, which is really fascinating. Well, you can read a verse this way. Or you can read it this way. He says, well, I take this as the dative case, not here as a verb. So there's sometimes, you know, Greek words can be, you know, a dative can be spelled the same as a third person singular verb or something like this. And so he'll point that out to the student, which is really interesting. And this is all kind of devoid in his stuff on Job, um, on Genesis Zechariah, where it's more like probably a commentary as we think of a commentary where it's going through. He doesn't get in some of the minutia. Mm -hmm. He'll make, you know, um, certainly not talking about what something's a dative or what the subject here. Um, and, and so it's just fascinating kind of seeing him teaching students yes. really how to read a text. And he'll use, you know, he's using the skills of, you know, what you would learn in, you know, a Greek grammarian. I, I'm not, he's not, you know, teaching them grammar per se. I, you know, I would disagree with some who argued that, but he's using the skills that people would use, right? It's like you, people use skills, right, from philosophy or not, how to read Christian texts. Um, he uses that to teach the students. And so, yes, he, he's, he's teaching them how to read texts kind of relying in some ways on classical paideia, right? Classical teaching and how can you use these stools to really get the most and have good readings. Yeah. yeah, so his students, they're not kids who are just learning the fundamentals of grammar. They already know how to read, they know grammar. He's just helping them apply it to the biblical text probably. Yeah, I, I don't think, um, you know, the, I, I kind of struggled, you know, where on the spectrum are these uh, students? Okay. Um, you know, Blossoms, Tanya thinks, you know, they're kind of, you know, low, low, lower level in Psalms, higher up in Ecclesiastes. You know, that may be the case, but but I could also see with some of these questions, they're quite insightful questions. So, so I could imagine kind of a mixed audience. Yeah. You know, some people that are pretty novice elementary. I don't think we're dealing with, you know, young children here, mm -hmm. but, you know, upper teenagers, right, adults, as well as maybe people just kind of sitting on lectures who probably did know quite a bit, who were saying, okay, what can I glean from this? Yeah, some of this is elementary, but yeah, there's some insights where Didymus will go and he'll give, right, a talk about his higher reading um, of a text, uh, analogical, you know, reading of, of a text, right, the allegorical mm -hmm. reading of a text, where I, I could think it could really appeal to people that were, you know, advanced well beyond the intermediate, you know, stages of grammar or exegesis, but we're, uh, you know, we know that Evagrius came, you know, Gregory of Nyssa, Jerome, um, Anthony, I think Anthony, Anthony we're coming and listening to him, so yeah, you know, I can imagine, I'm not saying those are the Psalms lectures, but I think a lot of people are coming and listening. It's probably quite a diverse audience, I would imagine. Yeah. You know, um, along with that, so I want to talk, because you brought up, you know, the Job and, and Genesis uh, commentaries in comparison. I want, I want to come back to that in, the, in a second, but just to kind of address your point a little bit. Um, so another fragment, a much lengthier fragment, uh, was published or edited by uh, the German, what, what was his name, Grun Grunewald? I can't uh, Grunewald, yep. Grunewald. Yep. And, um, you know, there was the part there in his Didymus's commentary where important philosophical, uh, ethical issues come up in the questions from the students. 
And there's a few different cases where the, the very important concept, propavia, comes up. So pre-passion. So they're talking about the passions. And you know, there's the, the text, I think, is it Psalm 40 or 41? Working completely from memory here, I, I cannot remember, but it's, um, uh, oh, Lord, have mercy on me, save me from my distress, or something like, uh, something along those lines. And Didymus had already previously in his lecture on that, uh, given this prosopological uh, interpretation of the psalm saying, this is spoken in the person of our Savior. So it's our Savior who's speaking this. So when it comes to this verse, the student kind of pauses for a minute and says, oh, wait a second, how, how does our, the soul of our Savior sin? And that kind of gets into a, a back and forth between Didymus and the student on the nature of, of the passions. And he appeals to the Jesus's agony in Gethsemane. You know, he says, well, he didn't really have a passion. He had a, a pre-passion. Mm -hmm. He had the preliminary movements towards a passion, uh, which sort of, it wasn't the sin that happens when a passion occurs. But it, this is all unfolding within these debates with the Apollinarians on, you know, that did Jesus have a full human nature? And they, of course, denied that he had a mind, which was the source of sin. But the questions suggest a certain degree of theological sophistication on the part of at least some of the students. And some of their concerns were doctrinal. Yeah, absolutely. And that is one that does come up, you know, as I mentioned, you know, a sinner, often they'll, you know, see things, well, if this is Jesus or David or somebody, how can they say the things they're saying? Mm -hmm. and, and so, you know, you know, with this idea of, right, this pre-passion that Didymus has, which is really quite interesting, right? It's kind of this stoic idea that as a human, and he, of course, does grant, right, you know, mortality, mm -hmm. we all have this, this kind of gut reactions, right? It's kind of, this, before you know passion, right, mm -hmm. passion, right, you want to have apatheia. Right, yeah. so you kind of get passionless, right? No fear, none of these things. And so he says, well, it's a pre-passion where everybody gets this, right? In their ancient kind of you know, form of you know, psychology. Mm -hmm. But it's once you allow it into a passion, well, now it is a sin. And so he says, okay. no, Jesus, he had to have some of this stuff, a pre-passion, but he, he always cut it off before it then went yeah. too far. Yep. Yeah. Um, and so he gives this quite long you know, um, discussion of this. I should point out there are a lot of discussions, you know, the theological, where he will talk about, you know, Manichaeism, he'll talk uh, uh, about Apollinaris and say, you know, um, he'll talk about the spirit, the, the, um, you know, um, he'll talk a lot about Arius or, you know, have a lot of digs at Arius. And so they are, yes, their lectures are kind of different, but there is a, a lot, of, I, I would say, an anti-heretical bent. And so there are very theological, certainly when he, he feels there is a passage being used by a group inappropriate. And this one, he says, he says, don't read it like this. Mm -hmm. This is how you ought to read it. He says, yes. those who are saying this ought to say, well, I talked to somebody. And it's really fascinating because it's actually, yes, I always had a discussion with somebody. Or I saw a philosopher say this, and this, here's, how, here's how you respond to them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so it's kind of nice where you get, you don't get things like that in, you know, Job, Genesis, Zechariah, where you get the stuff like, oh, yeah, there was an argument in Alexandria about something. But yes, the, there is clearly... Um, you know, theology um, is important. And I would even say, going along this, moral improvement. Yes. He is very concerned about the moral advancement. That, that undergirds that. You know, here's this idea of, you know, mimesis. You mimic, right? Look at biblical characters, mimic the good, don't mimic the bad. Mm -hmm. And so that comes a lot, this idea of attaining virtue, right? You know. Um, yep. yep. Yeah, and I, and I think that underscores the... The monastic, or at least at the very least, the ascetic component of his audience, because um, they are very strongly moral, but it's also tied into how they read the biblical text itself. So he's constantly telling them, look, you don't want to get stuck in this simple surface level interpretation of the text. You want to get into the deeper spiritual or allegorical meaning of it and apply it to your moral life. That's kind of what it seems to me anyway. It seems like he's teaching a monastic audience. Yeah, well, yeah, I, I think there's a lot. Yes, definitely. I think there's a monastic uh, audience predominantly um, there. And I think, yes, a lot of his spiritual interpretation is 
how can you make this, you know, I'd say morally relevant for you, for you and your improvement, you know, because Didymus is very much someone you know, that talks about this progression. Yeah. Right. Yeah. You, can, you know, you can keep progressing. And so this is how you improve. Um, and so he wants to make that very applicable um, to his students. Um, yeah. He, so there, there, in, yeah, he's not a that, commentator for sure. Yeah. So in light of that, there's um, in his uh, lecture on Psalm 28, he gets to verse 8b uh, and, and the lemma. And we'll talk a little bit about the, the importance of the lemma here. So I think that's also important for the orality of these lectures. But um, the, the verse in question is, and the Lord will shake the wilderness of Kadesh. And he has a very interesting conversation that kind of is so much what you're discussing here. It is possible, he says, that the wilderness being shaken is the calling of the nations, which, quote, did not have hope and were previously, quote, without God in the world. But since it has been shaken, it no longer remained idolatrous. It no longer remained without God. So God kind of shook the idolatry out of them, evidently. However, the wilderness of Kaddish could be, could be, so he's going with a different interpretation here, the remnant that remains according to the election of grace. So he's bringing in Romans. You get, just love patristic exegesis because they can throw in passages from other biblical books to support their interpretation of another text that has nothing to do with it historically. For Kadesh is the interpretate is by interpretation holy. So Kadesh in Hebrew, I guess, means holy. Therefore, the Lord will also shake the wilderness of Kadesh, that is bereft of shadowy and literal representations. So get rid of the literal interpretation here, concerning which Isaiah says, quote, if the Lord had not left to us a seed, we would have become as Sodom and like unto Gomorrah. Take note, Kaddish is interpreted as a transition from the shadow to the truth, from literal, from the letter to the spirit. So exegesis here. And then there's a question that a student raises. How is Kaddish holy? And then Didymus goes on. Uh, so you get a sense here that Didymus is trying to lecture on what it means to be holy, I guess if you could think of like a theological theme, but he's constructing a kind of interpretation of the passage, an allegorical interpretation of the passage to get to this theological conclusion. So, I, I mean, it, it seems, you mentioned earlier, you know, that it, it's more than just a school of grammar. There's something else going on here. There's a moral formation that's going on. And I think Didymus is trying to get at that in some of these lectures with this stuff. Oh, yes, he is concerned about the moral formation and advancement, um, right? Um, you know, uh, Hugh Bayless had done a book um, with O.U. Peel a while ago on, you know, kind of, you know, kind of virtue, right? Talks about, you know, this kind of idea of just really the virtue that he's trying to espouse. He does some good work on this. But yeah, these, the lectures, this is one of a few overarching themes mm -hmm. that you, you use this, you know, spiritual, right, higher rating to then impact your spirit to bring you to, you know, more, a more virtuous life. Yeah. <clears throat> so the acquisition of virtue is important. And I think in uh, earlier in his lecture on Psalm 28, uh, verse 2b, worship the Lord in his holy court. So he goes, so here he's kind of going through this different language, like what's, what is the court compared to uh, the house? And uh, so how lovely are your tabernacles? So you start with tabernacles, and then you go to court, and then you go to house. And he's got this line in here. Those who come to be above the courts, having been planted in the house of the Lord, bloom in the courts of the Lord, for perfection is not there. So this theme of perfection comes up in the quest for the, the moral virtuous life. And a student says, and this would be a question, I suppose that would pertain to this notion of free will, uh, is the one who is planted, planted in perfection. So you got sense here that perhaps a aesthetically inclined student say, so are some people already given to perfection or is this something that has to be acquired through progress? Well, that, that's a good question. Um, you know, he, he talks about this word, you know, prokope in Greek, right? Which is, is progress, right? You can advance. And, 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 you know, as you kind of look at Didymus, right, kind of theologically, um, what it seems, 
if you look kind of you know, as all well as texts, it seems that he, you know, he taught he has an interesting view like the pre-existence he talks about in Job, right? You know, pre-existence and you know, people kind of fell, you know, because you know, they're here and have to be kind of rescued. But he said some people fell not so that because they actually weren't um, doing what they should be doing, you know, pre-existently, mm-hmm. but solely for the purpose of helping others. Yes. So these are the saints. They've come down and their goal is to really be this beacon and guiding, guiding light. And so he, he'll kind of differentiate between, right, kind of your ordinary person and these few select, right, saints who are there to be these uh, beacons. Mm-hmm. And, and, you know, this advancement's really interesting because, you know, for Didymus, and this comes even to his, his view of the law, you know, he kind of looks at you want to be in the house of God. And so he kind of looks at, well, the tabernacle, so the whole 20, Psalm 20, it's interesting, you know, it's all about tradition. It's a Psalm about leaving, right, the tabernacle, right? So you leave the tabernacle. Um, and what you have there is he looks at this now as the journey of the soul. Yes. In this mundane world, you're in a tabernacle, right? You can't, you, you're, you're exiting it out. You hit the courtyard, but you want to get the house of God. Mm-hmm. And when you're there, now you're really in the presence of God. So he kind of looks at this allegorically. He says, okay, there's people leaving the temple and there's a festival, right? When they're, after they're done, they leave the tabernacle. But he says, no, there's a much greater meaning with the soul. And so it's the progression of the soul from a tabernacle through a courtyard, ideally into the house. So you want to get to the house and do this through moral advancement. And so it's really fascinating how you can advance and some who are already there can kind of help you along the way. And, yeah. and you, you, so pre-existence, of course, he gets that from Origen, who speculates and he just throws it out as a hypothesis. It's not a doctrinal point for him, but trying to account for how there's so much sin and, and uh moral diversity in the world while god is just he says well it, the cause for the diversity in the world must be some kind of pre-existent decision that was made before the soul you know entered a body so somehow some fell as a result of that choice and contingent upon the the gravity of the decision they fell to certain degrees but he maintains that the angels or somehow didn't really fall because of any choice, but as you as you say, Didymus applies here this notion that they they fell as as a means of helping the rest of us poor bastards who did fall uh, uh, find our way back. So uh, Didymus is certainly working within this origin originist tradition of understanding sin and the human condition, and okay. even his, even his notion of progress through different stages. I mean, that's origins, homilies on numbers. Yes, he very much, and, and I would say it's even a more developed, he kind of develops the preexistence. Mm. You know, certainly in, in Job, where it is a definite thing. You, you existed before, mm. you're here, mm. you'll exist afterwards. Mm. And uh, use it as, you know, you know, well, of course, in Job, of course, this comes up, right? Theodicy, why, why, why are bad things happening to good people? Yes. Yes. And so he then uses it. That's where he explains that. This doesn't come up elsewhere in his lectures, but there's one, it's very clear um, there. But yeah, I think it's pretty clear that he uses origin, cites origin, um, uh, you know, has a lot of admiration uh, for him. Philo, the same thing. He picked up on Philo, and it's very clear he's using uh, Philo, both explicitly and when he doesn't say it, even implicitly sometimes. I think with a lot of etymologies and things like that, he'll pick up on Philo. Yeah, which would make sense. I mean, he's teaching in Alexandria, so he's embedded in the Alexandrian tradition. So, um, okay, I want to go back now uh, to get kind of back into this return to our discussion of texts as artifacts. Mm -hmm. Um, So one of the things you draw, and you've mentioned it before, so you've got these other commentaries that he wrote uh, that are perhaps more polished than the lectures on the Psalms and um, Ecclesiastes. So a question that I have, and you talk a little bit about this in your introduction here, um, at, at Herculaneum in, in Italy, we uh, have the, um, what is it called? The Villa of the Papyri that mm-hmm. were discovered. And some scholars maintain that we see there texts that are in the process at various stages in the process of publication from, you know, initial drafts to uh, publishable versions. With Didymus's lectures on the Psalms, might it be the case that the difference between the Psalm lectures, say, and the Genesis commentary 
is that the Genesis commentary reflects a polished version for publication, whereas his lectures on the Psalms reflect an earlier stage in that development where the questions and some of the monotony haven't been edited out yet. That, that's how I take it, you know, generally, is that you find, you know, in those other, you know, Genesis, Zechariah, Job, more polished, more refined. Something else that's really interesting along this um, is the lemata in the Ecclesiastes and Psalms are very short. Mm -hmm. It's just one, you know, half line or one half verse in a psalm, where in Genesis, he'll, he'll have like three verses all together and he'll get like, you know, four pages of commentary. Well, it's never the case. It's always just a little half verse. Okay, a paragraph, half verse paragraph, mm -hmm. where you're getting, you know, um, him uh, addressing uh, that. And so, so what, what I see, what I present in the book is you know, I kind of envision it as where Didymus is giving lectures. I think this, think of it today, right? When people are writing books, you know, theological books or, or Christian or anything, they're probably giving lectures on this stuff first. Mm -hmm. You're presenting papers, you're working out ideas, you're getting feedback from peers and colleagues. Yeah. And so what I would see here in this Psalms material is kind of an early stage of what would eventually, you know, kind of get worked up to into a kind of a more polished or a commentary like what we'd expect, what we see in Genesis Zechariah and uh, Job. And so we see an early phase of this. And, and so here's what I would kind of imagine is going on. So Didymus is there giving lectures, mm -hmm. yes. and that there are, um, well, he's giving lectures. He is, um, we have shorthand writers there, right? You know the famous passage in Origin, of course, where he says, you know, as he's doing this, you have, you know, what, you know, uh, girls trained for beautiful writing, and seven, right, taku graphway in Greek, shorthand writers re relieving each other. Mm -hmm. So I think what you're getting here is people are then, you know, taking these lectures down, and what I imagine we then have in this text is that they then go and take down the shorthand. We have a lot of examples of shorthand. Even at Torah, they have a whole document of shorthand, which no one's translated. Um, don't have, you know, how to do this. Um, but then they would write out what I'd say in scriptio plana. You write out now what you have. Mm -hmm. And what I'm imagining is probably this is what we have now in the BYU material, other stuff, is that kind of second round. And I would imagine then this process that at some point, you know, as you keep working along, now that gets refined compressed, you know, you work stuff out and would eventually end in something publishable. Just like today, right? You start talking about stuff, you write a paper, then your paper eventually works in chapters, chapters in a book. This is what I think we're seeing here. And this is why it's really quite fascinating. Um, you see this, you know, I think, you know, there, the comparison, there's, um, you know, you have in Jerome's, what's it, I want to say commentary. We have a couple of references in, in Jerome and like uh, Ephesians, uh, but then in Matthew about saying how, you know, he's quickly, you know, writing out stuff, scribes are copying it down. He's then reading it over and then they're now writing out again, goes to trying to get stuff out. Mm -hmm. And so there's a whole process, right? Of, you know, a publication process yeah. for lack of a better term. And I think here it starts with lectures. Mm -hmm. You kind of start working, you're teaching people working it out. Um, you know, Jerome says he gave, you know, uh, you know, well, he had, you know, a commentary on all, 150 Psalms, you know, we have the small section 20 to 44 at Torah. Now, one of the things which is interesting here is we have the Katana for the Psalms from Didymus, right? This chain of transmission. Um, and when you read the Katana for the Psalms, you know, people are quick to point out these are quite different. And yeah, there's some differences. I did an appendix in the book, you know, for the ones I had where, yes, there's differences, but there's also some similarities. And so some saying is it, it's a completely different thing altogether. This would be more like uh, Blossom Stefanio uh, would think that. Um, Again, I, I'm not exactly sure I'm totally persuaded by that, but I, I certainly think we could agree on this as an early stage of something that is going to work toward, you know, you could work toward a, a publication. Um, and it, it makes sense, right? You're doing this stuff in like Herculaneum, right? You know, Philodemus, other things, people are doing this as they work toward a final product. You know, Augustine mentions this too in his letters um, on the work on the Trinity. You know, his, his famous letter, um, I forget the number now, but he talks about, you know, that he was circulating kind of early versions for a number of years before he finally said, okay, I got it right now. This is yep. what I want to do. And he was actually writing this letter saying, if you see the other earlier versions, ignore them. Don't pay attention because I'm now getting this. We can all kind of relate to a scholar. Someone's give a paper and a few years later, I'm like, why on earth did I say that? Yeah. But, uh, yeah. but, but yeah, I think this is what we're, we're witnessing that in these papyri. This yeah. Kind of and, you know, even Origen, so he's got this exchange with his friend Julius Africanus, who's in Jerusalem. And Origen is in um, uh, Caesarea, and Julius sent him a letter, you know, saying, "Why do you think that um, the the history of Susanna in the Book of Daniel is authentic?" 
he, he said that nothing about the linguistic characteristics suggests that this was original to the Hebrew, but this was a, a modern Greek edition. And Origen gives him a lengthy response. And at the very end of this letter, so first Julius Africanus at the end of his letter says, you know, I send you greetings. And then, you know, he adds a couple of names of his friends who are there with him. And at the end of Origen's letter, he said, he, he mentions, you know, Ambrose and a few other names. And Ambrose, he says, helped to make corrections to the letter before he sent it. And Diertosis, you know, the, the emendations, the fixing the, the errors that he made. So he, there is this sense, you know, that maybe he dictated it to a stenographer and then they went through it together and cleaned it up and sent it out. I can't imagine anything different would happen with scholarly texts, commentaries or homilies or anything like that. There must have been some kind of editorial um, process that happened. Now you use in here, we talked about the lemata, so the, the lines, the very short. And I wanna bring one up because it, it's actually quite fascinating here as like how this process would have unfolded. So you argue, and I think quite persuasively, that um, either Didymus himself or somebody else, a student perhaps, would have read the lemata, the lemma, and then Didymus would have lectured for a little while. And when he was done, maybe would have given a nod or something to the lector who would then read the next lemma, the next verse, and then Didymus would comment on it. But there's this interesting um, scene in his lecture on Psalm 27. And so Psalm 27 verse 4D, render to them their due reward. It, his comment on this is very brief. It's only a few lines. And then you get the next lemma, because they did not understand the works of their Lord. And Didymus's comment then after this, because they did not understand the works of the Lord, he goes back to talk about the previous verse. His comment here has nothing to do with the lemma that was quoted. So what you're, you suggest here, if I got you right, is that the, the lector read this verse before Didymus was ready to go on to the next lemma, or perhaps he had a thought occur to him that he wanted to keep because this lemma is repeated twice. What's going on there? Yeah, and you know, this is the thing, you know, so when in the other sections you had, you know, some of these uh, early German editors were saying, you know, this is a really, they said, well, the verses were at, well, some uh, had suspected the verse were at an after by somebody who was sloppy and kind of put him in. Mm -hmm. Well, no, I think we're seeing the, the classroom where probably you know, maybe a nod, or maybe Didymus when he just pauses, maybe pauses for a moment, like, okay, I guess I now go on. And, you know, how often have we all, right, done something and had an afterthought, oh, let me go back now to this and do this. And so you, you'll have times where more than once where a lemma is read twice. Mm -hmm. And it, it's because he doesn't address something, he then goes back and addresses that. So I'm imagining a scenario, and this is a scenario also, um, in the later Neoplatonic philosopher Olympiodorus in later Alexandria, mm -hmm. when he's giving his lectures on the Gorgias of Plato, mm -hmm. he it's very clear he's actually says the lector, okay, read something. Mm -hmm. And he apparently the lector will jump in, he has to actually stop and go back and re repeat something. And so you have you know these quote unquote you know misplaced lemata. And so I think that's kind of shows us the classroom where somebody reading this, and what for me, I think the fact you have some of these multiple in here sometimes, but one thing I think we're also, the, it's very clearly being read by somebody is, you know, there's been work done by like you know, Bart Ehrman on like, you know, the text of Didymus the Blind in the New Testament, comparing Didymus' New Testament quotations, you know, to what you have in the New Testament. And, you know, they're okay. And he's made arguments about, you know, what the variants mean and whatnot. But Didymus quoting from memory, but what's interesting is when you actually look at the Lemata and you go back and you start doing text criticism with the Psalms, like 95% of the time, they're, they're right on, they're spot on. Hmm. And so somebody's clearly reading this. Yeah. Uh, I think where when he starts quoting scripture, then you find Didymus kind of going all over the place sometimes with, you know, like we all do when we requote a verse, we throw in a word here or change up the word order. Well, so yeah, I think in some of the classroom, there's a lector there reading the material, and then he'll kind of go in and at times we'll even go back. And sometimes even a question seems to throw him off. Yes. A question will come up and he'll kind of go off and he'll have to kind of come back to uh, his um, lecture. But again, those of us that teach, 
when you see this going on, you're like, well, yeah, this happens every time in our classroom. <laughs> All the time this is going on, right? You're going back, you're correcting, you're repeating. Well, it's, it's amazing how you can connect with the, the atmosphere here. How many times you, I look at this and I say, wait a second, this happens all the time. You know, um, I remember uh, one of my, I think my very first guest on Patristicast was John Kloppenborg uh, mm -hmm. to discuss his book, Christ Associations. And I was reading that book and I was like, wait a second. This is like the seminar I had with him my first semester at the University of Toronto. So he's publishing this book. See, this is an afterthought because we were just talking about this earlier. Um, I was like, wait a second. I heard this stuff when I was in his classroom. This is the polished version of what he's talking about. Uh, but you also get his personality. You did him as his personality because there's, you talk about him getting thrown off. He got mad once uh, in one of his lectures on, um, I can't remember which one it was, Psalm 30 something, where a student asked, you know, what is a, what is a pre-passion? And the goes, I've talked about this so many times now. <laughs> he has to go through it again. You know, he's like a teacher fed up with students who are, you know, they have their uh, earbuds in or something like that and they weren't listening to him. They're watching TikTok videos or something. I don't know. You know, he said, he'll sometimes he's, once his students has something he says, I did not say that. This is what I said. Yeah. You know? and so, yeah. you, again, you, you'll find that, you know, you didn't, well, I didn't say it like that. Here's what I actually said, mm -hmm. or this is what I, I meant. And so it, it makes total sense you're in this classroom, which is, you know, on the one hand, kind of like, well, it's really mundane. But the other hand, it's totally fascinating because it's so unusual to have a source like this. You know, I, I can't think of another source like this for early Christianity where you, you're literally in a Christian classroom like that. I think the, the closest thing would probably have to be Origen's uh, dialogue with Heraclides, um, but that's not a classroom. He was invited to like a, a almost a local synod of bishops or something like that to talk about the doctrine of the resurrection and the nature of the soul. And you see there um, where the scribe will mention, you know, bishop so-and-so enters and then ask the question. Um, no, I haven't actually seen the, the artifact itself. I'm pretty sure it's a, on papyrus. I can't remember exactly what the- It's in Torah, yes, in Codex oh, 1. One of the Torah papyri. Mm -hmm. So that, but I don't know if it has anything like this. I don't know if that was in a more polished version, how to compare it with Didymus, but you do get like direct references to people coming in and asking questions and then origin responding. But yeah, I think the, the Didymus lectures have to be pretty unique. Yeah, the, I, I really you know, think they are um, really fascinating, right? You, you get to learn, you know, well, theology, what's a classroom like? And look at you know, classical, you know, uh, classrooms. Um, and, and so I look at a source, it was kind of remarkable it's preserved and really just preserved because of kind of an accident, right? They're kind of put in this cave and allied, right? Troops find this some 1500 years later. So, okay, so this brings up a question. I, I've got two more questions that I want to raise with you. So the, the material itself, the, the papyri fragments that we have, they don't, from my memory, they don't date from the time of Didymus themselves. They're actually dated, did you say earlier, maybe like a century or two after Didymus? Well, this is a good question. So in the Psalms, right, what you find, and this is my, my you know, impression, and then especially in working with, you know, um, Greg Sch uh, Schwender on this, um, is in these early, you know, ones run by Germans, they tend to date this stuff really late, like, you know, about 200 years after the, about Didymus. They're out here in like the seventh century or like, you know, late sixth century. You know, when you look at the hand of Ecclesiastes and Psalms, it's the same scribe. So whatever you did Ecclesiastes, you got to basically date that to Psalms. And paleography is an art more than a science, right? You're kind of gives kind of generally, you can't, you know, put in like, you know, a, a specific date or a five-year window. You're really dealing, I'd say, in paleography with a century or a half century at best. And when you look at the text, um, you know, when we began to look at the text and really talking to Greg, it appears this text is probably much earlier than what the Germans were putting that, where it could be, you know, um, 
really anytime fifth century up to right the reign of like you know kind of 600 justinian okay uh, this is what we had um there and, and you know I, I would even go back and even as i think about this for the paleography maybe it's even somewhat early now if i start talking late fourth century people might start getting uneasy or something like that but you know again you can't just pick a date you know we, we have these big things well it's you know 399 oh now we're into the you know 400 hour into the you know, fifth century something like that but yeah, I think it was much earlier than the Germans giving credit, but we allow a window about 100 years, but we can find parallels um, um, for that. This, uh, I guess, a, a separate, well, I guess it's not a separate question. I don't want to dwell on it too long, but um, is, are, is anybody doing carbon dating with this material or is that kind of the technology not there yet? You know, it's not really there. You know, Brent Nongbury has done some stuff and you know, written on this um, in his book, God's Library. Yeah, right. You know, with carbon dating, you're probably still getting down to about a century. Okay. So um, the, the standard is going by the handwriting. It, it's going by the handwriting, right? And you have comparanda. Now, you know, what's the ideal is that you have a dated, what I say is this, I always like what I'd say objectively dated comparanda, which is you have a text that actually has maybe a colophon, like with an actual date on it. Uh -huh. So you, you can say, you know, if you're dating stuff by, similar stuff and that stuff's off dated, then yours going to be dated. Yeah. But we have a lot of, what's nice is that I would say this, the, the text in the Psalms, Ecclesiastes is more like a documentary hand, right? Like a rapid cursive as opposed to an nice literary hand. Mm -hmm. And we have, right, hundreds of examples of that. They're all dated, right? They'll have, you know, regnal formulas, consular formulas we can date. Mm -hmm. And so we began to look at some of these unique things. I'm like, we're seeing this stuff already in the fifth century. Yeah. And even in the earlier part of the fifth century. Um, so, so yeah. Let's just say, for the sake of argument, let's just put a date on it, the year 500, just whatever. So if, so Didymus dies 398, and then about 100 years later, his lectures get copied. Now, why, a, a question emerges to me, why would a copyist want to copy out all of the stuff as it is with all of its imperfections? Because you do get a lot of repetitions. You get this here where there's the, the lemma quoted twice. What do you think is going on there? Why do you think, because if you think about, this obviously wasn't um, the final product. Did, Didymus probably would have wanted a, a more refined version of it. But why do you think a, copy, a later copyist would have done that? Well, if we have, if it's early, right, and quite early, then maybe it's, you know, this is one of the earliest copies of this. You know, this is a good question, right? I tried to address it in the first chapter. Um, you know, Didymus is kind of known, right? He's being read into the sixth century, right? People are regarding him as this kind of, you know, master commentator. And, and so all I, I might think here is there's something with Didymus and his lectures that it was appealing to know we're just going to copy it exactly as it is. Um, and so I see something like that going on uh, with his um, lectures, this need to do this. You know, you know, sometimes you look at, you know, even, I don't know, I think maybe artistic examples where somebody does something. It's like, we want to just copy exactly what they did. We don't want to change it at all. So this may be something that, you know, I'm imagining monks are the ones who are still reading Didymus, right, into the fifth, sixth, you know, century. And there's a German dissertation that talked about, you know, some of the, some of this reception of Didymus or evidence um, for that. And so that's a great question, but the best answer I can kind of think about is that he is revered. Oh. And so, yeah, here's a lecture. Let's just copy this lecture down, right? Um, just the very words that we have um, here. And, and so, you know, there also is, you know, we do have, at, you know, councils and ACTA for various councils about how important it is to get everything just right and the minutes and everything. And so maybe that kind of thing as well, this is what was, you know, copied. Let's just even copy, right? Warts and everything, we're going to recopy it. Yeah, no, I, I think there's probably something to that. I mean, he, even after the anathema against him was, would have been probably revered enough by a copyist to say, I don't want to mess with it. I'm just going to copy it as it is. Um, okay, so last question. Did a miss in tradition has been somewhat regarded as an unoriginal originist. You know, he's just repeating everything Origen said. There's nothing really 
special about Didymus. Your work on Didymus and his lectures on the Psalms, how would you describe him? What are your impressions of Didymus? Well, I would say certainly depend on origin, right? His hermeneutic is clearly dependent upon origin. So th there is something I think fairly said about this. To say Didymus is unoriginal, I would say you haven't read his works. In fact, I think he's too original, to be honest, in, in some of the things he goes at, right? You read his commentary on Psalm 28, right? And starts off this whole numerological understanding of, well, 28 is a perfect number. And so this psalm is actually about perfection. It's leaving the tabernacle and, you know, Procope, right? And becoming, right, perfect in the house of God, moving to the courtyard. Um, now, I know we don't have nothing on origin for Psalm 28. I'd be surprised if you address it that very same way, right? We do have this interesting. We have, you know, we had BYU. We have Psalm 36. But yeah. then we also have Psalm 36, the homily um, of this. And, and there are some theories, but also some differences. And so I don't think that's fair to Didymus to say that he's just this unoriginal. I think if you start reading some of this stuff, I, I think, yes, he has his own ideas. It's very clear, right? As I said earlier, I think he's really developed the idea of the preexistence from origin. Origin's putting this out there. Now Didymus is taking another step. Mm -hmm. um, so I think he has a lot um, to offer. You know, his, some of his, I, I would say, exegesis, I, I would say it's original. I think it's probably a little bit contrived with the numerology because you can kind of make, he's always like, oh, look at this number. And if you take the equilateral triangle, like he, he just finds a number and he can always make something fit. Now, he'll, and Philo will do some of the same stuff yes. um, also. So I think he pushes things to a bit extreme, but I, I don't see him just regurgitating origin. I'm saying, yeah, he, he's using origin, your Revere's origin, but yeah, he's, he has his own mind, he's interpreting things and addressing things in his own day very much concerned his interpretation about, you know, Arianism, things that obviously aren't even on the radar, right? Issues theologically that Origen's dealing with. And so he's, I, I think, it's not fair to say he's not an original writer. I, I think he has a lot to um, offer in, in that arena. Yep, I agree. I think uh, there's a lot that we can uh, learn and study from, from Didymus the Blind. Uh, Dr. Blumel. Wonderful conversation. We went through a lot today. Text says artifacts, a little bit of ascetic theology, peer, peering through the window of a fourth century classroom. Thank you very much for a wonderful conversation on, uh, on Patristocast. Thanks so much for having me. It was a real pleasure. And uh, till next time, I'll see you all later. And Dr. Blumel, take care. All right. Take care.